Welcome to the NHL Wraparound Podcast, featuring Neil Smith, President, General Manager of the 1994 Stanley Cup champion New York Rangers, and longtime ESPN NHL veteran Vic Morin. Together, they share no-nonsense opinions on news and issues around the National Hockey League. Whether you're a casual or diehard fan, each episode of NHL Wraparound will leave you more informed. Now, here's your hosts, Neil and Vic. Hey folks, and welcome to episode six of NHL Wraparound, Vic Morn and Neil Smith. And Sunday night, another big ceremony. Chris Chelios having his number seven race to the rafters at the United Center in Chicago. But by night's end, it was Patrick Kane returning to the Windy City to have a heroic overtime goal to push the Red Wings over the Blackhawks. But that's in the past. Neil, what's coming up on the show? Well, what's coming up on the show is uh, the one-timers are coming up, yours and mine. And then we're going to talk about the Eastern Conference and the trade deadline and who's probably going to get moved based on their UFA status coming up. After that, we're going to have Brian Burke, who is the executive director of the Professional Women's Hockey League Players Association. Uh, uh, always an entertaining guest on any show he's ever on. And then we're going to talk about the West conference and their trade deadline same trade deadline but for the western conference and what players will be on the move out west uh, based upon their ufa status we're going to end the whole show with the human side of the story and some personal dialogue but first let's hear from our sponsor from howdy hughes from bellavo to bedard we're your source for game worn jerseys go to migrate.com M-E-I-G-R-A-Y dot com to start your collection today. Get real. Get it from Igre. So Vic, what is your one timer? I'm passing you the puck. I'm glad to take a shot here. So my one timer is on the Calgary Flames and Saturday night. Finally, the Battle of Alberta really lived up to its name. Just a a nasty, nasty game with the Oilers. 80 penalty minutes. Uh, The Flames were physical with Connor McDavid. They frustrated Leon Dreisaitl. There were two fights. Blake Coleman and Matthias Janmark just had a doozy. And Mackenzie Weger and Corey Perry also exchanged some pretty good blows in that game. The point here is that had the Flames shown the urgency, the purposeness, the edginess in the first three quarters of the season, as opposed to just packaging it up into that game, they might be talking about trying to advance in the playoffs instead of fire sailing players at the deadline. The, the fl- you're, you're right. The Flames have played a lot better lately, and, and uh, it is uh, a shame that they didn't get their act together a lot earlier. But I want to talk about the Devils, Vic, because the, the Devils, uh, people, you know, they're disappointed in this season, obviously. But they, they had a great year last year. This season, all you hear about is the Devils in their goaltending, the Devils in their power play isn't going well. Uh, Jack Hughes has been hurt quite a bit. Dougie Hamilton's been hurt quite a bit. But here's an interesting take on the New Jersey Devils. Only six times at the Prudential Center this season, six times out of 31 games at the Prudential Center in Newark, have the Devils scored first. How prepared are you mentally as a player coming out onto the ice if your team has only scored the first goal of his home game six times this season? And you know what the percentage is of teams that score first in winning? 68% of the teams that score first go on to win a game in the National Hockey League this season. That's how important that is. On the road, they're not much better. They've only scored first 10 times on the road. And that brings you to a grand total of 16 times. The Devils have scored the first goal of the game. And 42 times the opponent has scored the first uh, goal of the game. It's by far the worst scoring first, trailing first record in the NHL. Next to them is the San Jose Sharks, who have done it 22 times. That's six more times the Sharks, the lowly Sharks, have done it than the New Jersey Devils. And when you're chasing the game that often, put that in a package over the course of the entire season, and that's why they will continue trying to chase a playoff berth right up until the very end. 
This one-timer segment has been brought to you by the Ninsel Wealth Partners. Our goal is to be your primary source of financial advice. Our mission is to provide quality strategies customized to your needs. We recognize that you place your trust in our ability to help you achieve your goals. To us, there's no greater honor, and without question, there's no greater responsibility. And welcome back to the wraparound. Neil, I'm going to put you in the GM seat again. And in the Eastern Conference, you've got a number of players that are with clubs that uh, are kind of in Never Never Land in terms of whether or not they're going to re-sign or move their unrestricted free agents. So, um, you know, there was once a movie, The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh. Well, is Jake Gensel the, sh- the, uh, the fish that saves Pittsburgh this time or is he on the move? Uh, if he doesn't resign, he better be on the move. Uh, you know, Dubas has to move him. If he can't resign him, he can't hesitate and say, well, we might make the playoffs. And so I can't do anything. No, he's got 59 uh, points in 59 playoff games. He's a valuable commodity. He's hurt, but he, he's he's only going to be hurt for a couple more weeks and then he'll be back. It's just a, it's a uh, an injury that is commonplace in the league. So uh, Gunsel has to either sign or be relocated. You mentioned Jersey before and the struggles that they have had playing ahead all season long, and they've also got a couple of big names out there: Tyler Toffoli and Brendan Smith. Yeah, you know uh, the the thing with the Devils is similar to Pittsburgh, and that is uh, is Fitzgerald going to want to tell the fans I'm throwing in the white towel on the season? This is the hard thing to do for the general manager because when you start to trade players like uh, Tyler Toffoli or even Brendan Smith, who's I think has been real good for them this year at 35 years old, um, you're you're signaling to your fans that you know we're giving up on the season. Tyler Toffoli is a very valuable guy. He's won Stanley cup uh he would be a great asset for somebody who's wants to increase their power play um going into the playoffs however will the devils signal to their fans that they're giving up i don't think they will but it'll be a shame if tyler Toffoli walks out of new jersey for free in the summer And certainly Smith best known this season for knocking uh, Connor Bedard out for a long stretch of time with a broken jaw. Yeah. Let's move over to uh, Washington. Anthony Mantha. Yeah, Mantha is an interesting case and not not hasn't shown much playoff numbers, but he is a free agent, uh, unrestricted free agent at the end of the year. Again, I'm sorry to to keep repeating this, but if, if the Washington Capitals trade Anthony Mantha, do they signal to their fans that um, they don't think they're going to make the playoffs um, when really they're in a playoff spot uh, right now and and have been for a while, as remarkable as a lot of people think that is with uh, the talent they have on the team and the way the injuries have gone. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if Mantha stays or Mantha goes. Well, they've certainly hung in the fight uh, and have really overachieved as a club this year. But let's switch to an underachieving team, the New York Islanders, and uh, one of their really physical presence players for a long period of time, a guy that has uh, just passed a thousand games, Cal Clutterbuck. I don't think they'll trade Cal Clutterbuck. He has a free agent at the end of the year, unrestricted free agent. Um, you know, he's one of those guys that plays a great fourth line role uh, for the Islanders. He's done it in other teams and in Minnesota it was one of them. Um, I, I don't think that Lou Lamorello will uh, trade him by the deadline. I think he'll stay pat. Former cup winner, Eric Johnson in Buffalo. Put in a lot of playoff time with the Colorado Avalanche for a lot of years, including the Stanley Cup two years ago. He's a first overall pick way, way back, but still can add some experience. He can add uh, playoff, valuable playoff experience. I think he's played 80-something playoff games, and uh, he's still a big man, still a dependable piece back there on defense. Vladimir Tarasenko a year ago was on the move to New York and looks like he may well be sought after again at this deadline. You know, Tarasenko is an interesting case because he's on a one year contract with Ottawa. A lot of people expect that he'd get moved at the deadline. Um, If you think of him as a guy who 
didn't do much last year for the Rangers in the playoffs. So therefore, um, why would somebody want him for this year's playoffs? I can tell you, when you look at his playoff record, it's pretty good. He's played a lot of playoff games with the St. Louis Blues and including winning the Stanley Cup with them. So I think, again, a team um, needs one more offensive piece, one more piece for the power play. Vladimir Tarasenko is somebody they've got to consider. And unlike a lot of shows that they make predictions and forget it, we're going to revisit these seven players after the March 8th trade deadline. We will tackle the West after our interview with Brian Burke. You've probably heard us talking about our Dura jeans, and I will say that I have extended from going out to dinner in Dura jeans to going out to appointments in Dura jeans. You're going to appointments with jeans on? These what kind of are, appointments? Are, are these are the unemployment line? No, no. These are all-purpose jeans. Door makes stretch performance denim and lifestyle apparel for men and women. Door has five times the stretch of traditional denim, and they're designed to last for years. It's time to level up your wardrobe with Door. Order your own pair today. Check out Door's flagship stores in Los Angeles and Denver or shop online at shopdoor.com slash NHL fan. Right now, our listeners can get 15% off site-wide when you use our special URL. Don't wait to get 15% off. Go now to shop com slash NHL fan. Don't wait. This is a great deal. Shopdoor.com slash NHL fan. And now not only is it my privilege, it's sort of my honor to bring in an old friend of mine. And when I say old, we're not old, but, you know, we've been friends for a long time. Brian Burke, who is the executive director of the Professional Women's Hockey League Players Association. But, Brian, you and I go back to 1985. You were a guy representing Ray Stazak, and I was uh, with the Detroit Red Wings. We ended up signing Ray Stazak and... uh, uh, that's when we first met. We've been friends ever since, or I'd like to say we've been friends ever since. You went on to Vancouver after that, and uh, uh, here we are today in 2024, still uh, yucking it up between us. So welcome to NHL Wraparound, and thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me on, Now We've been friends for many, many years. You know, um, the first thing I'd like to say is, or ask you about is, obviously, having been president of the uh, – the president of the Pittsburgh Penguins for two years and with Ron Hextall as general manager and uh, a different ownership group. Most of the time you're there, but you must be keeping your eye on the Penguins. It would be natural just the same way as I keep my eye on the Rangers. And I just wondered what your thoughts are on them in the, the, you know, last year and now this year, which sort of seems uh, very similar in my eyes to last year. Well, first off, um, you know how that works, Neil. I've I worked for three teams that got sold. I got fired all three times. So when Fenway Sports Group bought the Penguins, uh, actually, and I knew we were in trouble, and we were, and they made that change. And that's ownership's right. Ownership when they buy a team, they have the right to have whomever they'd like run that team. So there's no bitterness there. I do still follow the team. Um, it's been an up and down season for them. Uh, Tristan Jari's putting up unbelievable numbers. Sid is doing unbelievably well. Uh, and yet they haven't made up too much ground in the standings. So I don't know what to make of them. Depends on what day of the week you ask me. And I think Jay Kensel's going to hurt them a lot. He's a really good player that no one talks about. Neil, uh, Brian, you've been quoted, one of your best quotes is, July 1st and the trade deadline are the two times of the year that NHL GMs lose their minds. Gensel is hurt right now, and it kind of puts Kyle Dubas in a little bit of a quandary because his contract's expiring. What do you do with this player? Well, the return to play dates well in advance of the end of the season. So to me, I would be treating, treating this player as if he were healthy. I'd say you can look at the medical information you need. Yeah, I can show you that he's going to be fine. He's a durable guy. He has not suffered from injury problems. He plays hurt too. So I would be treating this as if if you were indeed going to – I think a lot of the talk of trading Jay Kensel is overrated. But if you are serious about it, I would treat him as if he were a healthy commodity. Do you think Pittsburgh manages to get him signed? Uh, I think they're going to end up signing him. My own view is I think this talk about signing him is a lot of a nonsense, frankly. 
I want to move over to another big deal that was made back in August, and that was the acquisition of Eric Carlson, who uh, it was seven properties that uh, that the, the Penguins wound up giving up. They did get some return. They did save some cap space. But to me, this was a lot of chips going into the middle of the table by Dubas to get this one player to supposedly – help this power play become even more effective. And to a large degree, it's worked in the opposite. They went 13 games, almost an entire month without a power play goal early in the season. And even though they had two power play goals Sunday against Philadelphia, it just seems like it's a perimeter power play that does a lot of passing around the outside. And it's almost like they're trying to pass the puck into the net instead of, uh, instead of making, you know, really solid plays into the middle of the ice and creating screens and, and whatnot. Well, I think if you look at power plays, I think you break it down to, first off, do you have adequate personnel? Do you have enough skilled people, enough good decision makers, enough shooters to have a good power play? Because if you don't, you're not going to have a good power play. doesn't matter how well it's coached. But they do. They've got weapons. And so it comes down to how are you, how are you running the power play itself. The breakouts and entries seem fine. They get into the zone pretty good. And then, like you said, they uh, – they overpass the puck sometimes, or seem to anyway. I don't know what the right answer is. I know my answer when I was in Pittsburgh was, why don't we go low to high and shoot a few times? Start cranking the puck at the net, get two guys in front of the net. But I know they've tried that as well, and it does seem like they're waiting for a perfect chance and waiting for perfect opportunities. That works sometimes, but it doesn't work a lot. Does that surprise you, though, with the likes of Sidney Crosby and uh, Evgeny Malkin, Chris Letang on one point, you've got Gensel, they've got Raquel over from Anaheim, that they couldn't get this figured out or they really have struggled all season long in this area? I mean, they, they have bumped up to 28th from 30th, but that is way below the standard of considering the talent of this group. Yeah, I'd say the same thing again, Vic, is that given that the weapons they have, it does not make sense. It does not compute, to use the old uh, science fiction saying, it does not compute, does not compute. Um, it doesn't make sense. So you have to make some adjustments or try different personnel. But they've got good coaches in Pittsburgh. They figured that out. I mean, they would have tried all these things. I don't watch the team as closely as I normally would because I watch so many of the women's games now. So I'm missing a, a lot more hockey than I used to, and I love the fact that I'm missing it for a great reason. But I don't know. I don't follow it like a hawk like I did last year. So um, I really can't give you a better answer other than my guess is they're, they're quality coaches. They're smart guys. They probably Anything I give you as a suggestion is probably something they've already figured out and tried. Yeah, Brian, I want to ask you about something that might be sensitive, and if it is, uh, you, you can tell me, but – I can't figure out the Mike Sullivan factor in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, they they won the cup, the two cups, seven years ago. Um, I looked at all the other coaches that have won Stanley Cups and how long did they last after their last Stanley Cup. Uh, Joel Kenville won, you know, three Stanley Cups and only lasted three years after the third one. Daryl Sutter lasted only three years after the second Kings Cup. Um Mike Babcock was seven years in Detroit after winning the cup there, but it, it's just a, it's just weird to me that Mike Sullivan has lasted this long with the lack of, um, you know, missing the playoffs last year. Now this year, not being very good. Um, it was weird to me when the new ownership, you know, lets go of the president and the GM and the coach stays that you, you rarely see that. And then in comes a new GM and, and again, the coach stays. Um, is there something that I'm missing here? No, and it's not a sensitive topic because I am a, a fan generally of Mike Sullivan. He's, I will tell you this, his teams are the most prepared teams I've ever seen. I've never seen our teams go into war better prepared than we were in Pittsburgh. Never, not even close. And we want to stand like up in Anaheim. I've had great coaches. And Mike Sullivan brings his team to the to the to the fight more prepared or better prepared than any team I ever saw before in my life. And that's all the years I watched, all the years I GM'd. Um, and he's and he's a good person. He's, he played at BU. He's an honest player. 
Um, and I, I'm going to give you a different answer, I think, than you might expect, Neil. I'm shocked at the lack of patience in pro hockey. And you've heard me rant about this. I think it's absurd that guys are fired as quickly as they're fired. I think the turnover level is insane. And I think it's just going to get worse. And so to me, I'm not going to comment on Mike Sullivan and why he's lasted this long without pointing out that I generally applaud this. I think our, our industry is way too impatient, way too impatient. And I've ranted about this. I think we've got a bunch of new owners who don't have a clue what they're doing. And I think it's going to get worse because I think expansion is coming. I am dead set against expansion. It's every 32 years now you win a cup. They're going to make that 40 or 45 or 50 or 60. Are you kidding me? We're going to start having parades for divisional winners, for God's sake. So to me, I look if you look at the value of teams, if they said we're not going to expand for 20 years, the values of the existing teams would double instantly. But right now the threat of expansion keeps people interested. They'll get a billion dollars for an expansion team. They will dislocate their shoulders voting for this, even though it's insanity. We don't need more teams. We don't need more travel. We need fewer games. 32 teams is just fine, and I think the madness should stop, but it's not. And these new owners are the worst. I'm not pointing to Fenway. I'm saying new owners in sports, they have no patience. They have no sense that, okay, it's every 32 years. You think they understand, any of them understand that math? Not a chance. No. But, Brian, you know, you you make a good point. I want to bring up something else uh, aside from the Sullivan thing, which, by the way, I come from your era, and I I know that when we got into the league as general managers, it was a black mark to fire a coach. You you didn't want to fire a coach because it it looked bad on you. And now I just want to bring this up. In the coaches that have been replaced this season, here's the bad news for coaches. Other than Patrick Waugh, all of them are doing better than their predecessor or they're over 500, all of them. And so the point is why I say that's bad news for coaches is because in this league, as you're talking about, these new people are going to say, well, look at the results they got by firing their coach. Why don't we do that? Why don't we get a new voice? And I think that's bad for the game. That's a big problem because you're right. This year, the, the turnover has been favorable and positive for almost all the teams involved. And that's not a good thing because historically it hasn't had a great impact. I did a study on this one back when I worked for Pat Quinn. We call it the dead cat bounce. You got a little bounce from a from a coaching change because even a dead cat will bounce if you drop it on a trampoline. But you don't get much of a bounce. And so you get the dead cat bounce and not much else. And I, I did studies on these over the years, and it hasn't had a dramatic impact. Change of personnel has had a more significant impact. But this has been an aberration. Edmonton, dramatic change with the coaching change. Vancouver, dramatic change with the coaching change. So you're right. That throws my theory into suspicion a little bit. But I still think the best way to do this is build your team, build your coaching staff around your team, and do it properly and be patient. But I don't think these owners have any patience. And I don't think they have much acumen either. I don't think some of them are that smart about how they do things. Brian, I want to uh, shift over now. Uh, we're going to shift over to the women's game and uh, have a little conversation about the PWHL that you're uh, executive director now of the uh, PWHL Players Association. And I want to talk about the connection with women's hockey. And Neil's mom was a great player in her day back in Winnipeg. And I know the importance of women's hockey to him. What drove you? to the women's game and your position that you're in right now? Well, I never spent much time on the women's game until Nagano. I went to Nagano and saw high-level women's hockey for the first time. I paid attention finally, and I fell in love with the game, and I became a season ticket holder with the Calgary Inferno, season ticket holder with the Toronto Furies. I went to most of the international competitions. I knew all the players. I had favorite players. One test, if someone says to you, I love women's hockey, okay, who's your favorite player? Because you, if you're a true fan, you'll have a favorite player on each team or in each league or a um, favorite American player, favorite Canadian player. I had them. I had favorite players. And so I was around them. I knew them. So when I got offered this job, um, a lot of people have told me since you should have just waited. You would have got something else from the NHL. And I, I said, I know that. There's no question in my mind. Had I waited, I could have gotten something else. I didn't want to wait. I couldn't believe it when I was offered this job. I leaped out. I started crying. 
I leaped at this job. So um, I, I think it's uh, amazing. Like I was at the game this after, yesterday afternoon. I'm going to speak to the women and take them out to lunch today and see them play again tomorrow. I'm enjoying this thoroughly, and I think it's a great game, and I feel very fortunate to be involved. I feel I think it's one of the best jobs I ever had. You know, uh, Brian, uh, Mark Walter and Billie Jean King uh, own the league and uh, had to make a deal with the Players Association uh, to make all of this a reality from from what I've studied. And uh, can, can you walk us through how this all happened? Because it's it to some people, I had a comment the other day that, where they said, I don't know why they need a PA when one guy owns the whole league. And, of course, I know that they, the PA was around before the, this was around. But can you walk us through it? Well, you can first off call up the idiot that told you that and tell him it uh, was the central part of, of this whole negotiation to have a committee that drafted the CBA with the player. There were five players on the board that worked this out with legal counsel. John Langle, who's a famous lawyer in Chicago, he was the active executive director. He directed negotiations. Then they decided to hire an, an executive director and a deputy executive director. And I told them when I took the job, I would happily take it for two years. So the, the moron that told you that, you can tell them to be comfortable. I'll only be there for two years because I think it should be handled by a woman after that. And then uh, that that's what I told them. Now, if they want me to stay on in some capacity, I will. I love my job. But I think a woman should be doing this job in two years, a year and a half now. How did the whole thing come about, though, with Mark Walter? And do you know anything about that, the, the, begin, the very beginnings? No, I haven't met Mark Walter. I haven't met Billie Jean King. I met uh, Billie Jean's partner, uh, Alana Kloss. I, I met her. She's lovely, a very smart, talented lady. Um, I think we're very blessed to have this ownership group. They've got deep, deep pockets, and they love women's hockey. This started with Mark Walter's wife, Kimber. She apparently became an aficionado and had players building at their house that, that played in that league. Um, that's where the love of hockey comes from, and that's where Billie Jean King is the greatest advocate of women's sports, maybe in the history of the, of the world, uh, came about in her involvement. So that's how they started the league. They've, they bought the other league out, so it was important to get one entity, and then they funded and staffed this properly. They've given the women their best chance to win. We've been given our best chance to win. The teams are funded properly. They're staffed properly. There's six teams, so there's star players on all six teams. The travel is compact. The farthest trip is Minnesota, and that's where I am today. So most of the travel is bus travel, and it's been done very scientifically and very efficiently. This gives the women their best chance to win. We're determined to take advantage of that. So we owe the, the family a lot, but I don't know them. I don't know them personally. Okay. You know, just, just, uh, for those of us that don't know and the people uh, listening that don't know, what, what would the average salary be in the league? And, and how does that compare to the pro leagues in the past that women have had? Well, the average salary was whatever they got paid. It was, it didn't matter what it said in the contract. It was whatever they ended up getting paid. A lot of them didn't get paid a fraction of what their contract said they would. A lot of them were playing for peanuts. So not all had other jobs, all worked to, you know, like there's no, there's no uh, living wage. The goal of this league, the goal of, of the PWHL is that women can get a living wage to be professional hockey players. And so the minimum salary is 35000 plus 15 U.S., plus 1500 U.S. a month in housing. And that's a living wage everywhere except, you could argue, maybe not New York, but the, the women play and train in Connecticut, Bartley, and maybe not in Toronto, but they're making it work. But the, the salaries go up to $100,000. The average salary would be around $55,000 for this year. So this is – and they have massage therapists. They have athletic trainers. They have uh, equipment trainers. They have assistant coaches. They are staffed and funded properly. This league will lose a lot of money until we get going. So this is a labor of love. They're doing this the right way. They're doing it for the right reasons, and we'll make it work. Brian, they've also brought some new rules into this league, and uh, one of the ones Neil and I were talking about, and uh, I think it would be interesting to see if the NHL someday adapts this, uh, is the jailbreak, where uh, if a player's in the penalty box and her team scores a shorthanded goal, that player is released from the penalty box. Yes. 
and uh, also the standings. And there's been a lot of talk not, uh, in I'm the not, NHL. They, they, I'm not big on yeah. the role change. That's why I'm giving you a short answer. <laughs> I knew that. I could see that. <laughs> it, it's to me. It, it's kind of. It's kind of cute though. The women like it, and that's all that matters. The fans seem to like it. So I'm. I'm old school. I'm like Neil. I'm very old school. But I didn't like this rule. I wasn't consulted on it. But the fans seem to like it, and our players seem to like it. So have at her. And the standings. The standings are great until you get you get. Um, the reason we've never gone to three two one scoring, and Neil knows this is. It widens the gaps in the standings so early. It makes them so wide. It looks like your team is 80 points out of a playoff spot when it's really 20 points out. And it's bad enough. It looks bad enough. So I think my guess is our league will outgrow this over time. But right now it seems to be wildly successful. People like it. I'm on board. What about the physicality rule? Which is, uh, uh, you know, there's been talk about, you know, body checking, no body checking. And there's kind of a a little bit of a unique role for physicality in the PWHL. Yeah. And I think the best way to explain that is it's a work in progress. I I, I can't speak for all the women because I'm talking to them today to one of the teams in Minnesota about this today. One of the topics is how much physicality do we want? We almost had a fight in the game last night. I'm pretty sure. Our young fans do not want to watch fights. I'm pretty sure. I love fighting. I don't think it has a place in our game here, and that's fine. Um, and how much hitting do you have? Because when you, you say to yourself, it's very physical. I love it. I think the way we play now is, is just right. But I'm worried if it gets rougher than that, because that's when the knee injuries come. That's when the shoulder injuries come. That's when the four- to six-month rehabs come. And we are we need our star players. We need a game where they can play consistently and not be banged up. So we've got to maintain that balance. I think we've hit it just perfectly. Last night was a rough game, but no big vicious hits, no cheap shots. Uh, what was supposed to be a penalty was called, uh, but they allow the, the women to play, and I think the women want to play, and I think the game is better because they're allowed to play. But I think we're at a point now where we better be careful that we don't go any farther down that uh, down that path. Neil, there appears, uh, uh, Brian, there, there appears to be a real market for the new league. Um, there is an attendance of 19,285 on February 16th. You've already laid out the structure and just how thoughtful the planning has gone into this. Why will this league work long term? Well, I, I think because first off, I think it was conceived properly. Collective bargaining agreement, the number of teams, the staffing, the funding is all set up to say, okay, if we fail now, it's because our fans have failed us or we have failed us. So they've given us our best chance. That's all an owner can give you, in my view. And I think we're going to grab it and run. We're already doing that. We had 10,600 here last night in St. Paul, 10,000 fans. We had 19,000 a week ago Friday in, in Toronto. Had there's sixteen thousand or thirteen thousand here in St. Paul a couple weeks ago. So, and we're playing neutral site games coming up in Pittsburgh and Detroit to test new markets and see what we can do. So I think people have responded amazingly. They love the game. They love the women. They love the product. I think it's it's been beyond all expectations. But we're still going to lose a lot of money for a long time, and that's where ownership, I believe, has come in with deep pockets and a plan that'll work. I assume expansion is part of that at some point. They have not asked me about that yet, but I talked to Stan Kasten about it, who's one of the principals in the league. I think that's going to happen at some point, but not in a rush. We've got to stabilize what we've got going, get people familiar with our rivalries, and get some rivalries developed. There's a lot that goes into this, in my view, for the first two, three, four years, and then look at expansion. Do you ever see the NHL stepping in and maybe providing some aid to help make this float long term? Well, I think what they've done, what the league has done so far, has been all indirect support. So they put in a three-on-three part of the All-Star game in Toronto, which was magnificent. And that was, they didn't have to do that. It was great. Uh, they've added women to the skills at the, at the All-Star game. Um, they they added an outdoor game, or they've tried to at some of the other outdoor games. They, they've added indirect support. And um, I think it, we're very grateful for that, by the way. It's, I think Gary's a big supporter. Whether it be uh, take the form of greater support, direct support, that's something we'll discuss with the NHL in the future. But at this point, no. Um, our plan is to operate without direct support for now, and then we'll see. 
Uh, last thing, Berkey, before you, you go, and I, I appreciate you staying all this time with us. Um, I want to mention personally uh, two things that I don't think that Brian Burke gets enough credit for. Uh, the first one was building the Vancouver Canucks into a uh, cup contender by the acquisition of the Sedin twins, which uh, is probably the one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. None of, none of the rest of us at that time could see that and envision what that would do to a franchise the way you did with the Canucks. And I, 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 I've never thought you got enough credit for doing that. Uh, it was, it was really turned that whole franchise around. Well, I appreciate that. I will tell you, I don't ever talk about the Sadines without talking about two people. And you've heard this speech before, and I don't want to go on for half an hour, but there are two guys that deserve credit for the Sedin twins, and neither one of them is Brian Burke. One is Thomas Gredin, who saw the vision, had the vision to see the ability of these kids. Thomas Gredin started talking about the twins the year before I drafted him. And I told him after the World Juniors in Winnipeg, we are not doing this. We are not drafting. I'm trading the pick. The kid, the twins were not good in Winnipeg. And I told Thomas Green after the draft, I said, are we done with this now? I am trading the pick. I am not drafting twins. I'm not drafting one twin, one Swede, let alone two. And then I went to the World Juniors in Norway because Thomas Green made me, begged me to go. And that's the first time I could see this twin thing, this symmetry they had. So Thomas Green, the other one's Mark Crawford, who turned him into players. Mark Crawford was magnificent with the twins. Well, wow. and the, the the other thing I, I want to bring up because I think it's timely is uh, you were the architect of a Stanley Cup in Anaheim, which is like winning it in the North Pole. I mean, you you won it in a small market. You know, uh, uh, nobody has ever done that. I mean, look at the rest of the league. We got a bunch of North Poles in the league now, and and I don't see any Stanley Cups there. You went there with the Samuelis. Uh, you turned that into a Stanley Cup team. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on today's Anaheim Ducks with, and, and where they're at. And can, I know it's a really hard place to build a hockey team. Can, can they do it? What do you think of the Ducks now? Well, I think people, thanks, Neil, by the way. And, and I should point out when I went there, the other finalists for the job of the, of the, the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, which is what we were then, was Neil Smith. And I was, you know, I was nervous that Neil was going to get the job, and I wasn't. And I really wanted the job, and I, I didn't really want it. I, I thought it was uh, North Pole, to be honest with you, until I met the Samuelis. Then I interviewed with the Samuelis, and I desperately wanted the job because they're such wonderful people. But um, I think the, the what people lose sight of, and people say, oh, Carolina, this and that, they lose sight of the fact one stroke of genius, and Gary Bettman doesn't get credit for a lot of things, I think, that he should, but the one true stroke of genius is revenue sharing. And Bob Goodnow deserves some credit for that, too, because he pushed very hard for that. Each of the teams in the league that makes huge money has to write a huge check. The Toronto Maple Leafs have to write a check for, I believe this year, it'll be $30 million U.S. $30 million U.S. that goes to the have-nots. And then the New York Rangers will have to write a check for close to that. The Edmonton Oilers, all the high-revenue teams have to write a check. They can't just pocket that money. And this was the union and the league agreed, if we're going to have a cap, then we have to have a, a floor. We have to make sure a certain amount of money is spent. So Anaheim, in a bad year, or, or you know Carolina in a bad year, or um, if you go back you know, a few years before that, different teams that struggled financially, Buffalo in a bad year, they get a big check for that. So they're allowed to, they're enabled to compete. I like what Pat Verbeek has done. I think he's brought in some good young players. I think they're going the right way. They're a ways away, but uh, I like their leadership now. And and uh, you, you forgot to mention uh, Arizona playing in a high school building. Well, Arizona playing in a high school building, I went to a game there last year. It was the most fun I've had at an NHL game. I could see the, I could read the players' names. It was up in the press box where Neil and I always sit. We can't even read the, 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 the barcodes across the back, the name bars. So to me, I, I, Mullet Arena, I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, I had trouble getting in and out of the arena because I had no idea who any of us were. They're like, get out of here. You can't sit there. I'm like, I am the president of the hockey operations here. And they had no idea. But I, it was really cool going to a game there. And again, they'll start it out. People are quick to jump on the Arizona thing, but 
I've been in those meetings when we voted to keep Arizona around. It wasn't just Gary Bettman. That's a six million person market. We should just scoff at that and, and, and discard it because we're in the wrong place. That's what's wrong with the with the Arizona Coyotes. We're not in the right place. And so that's been the mismanagement here. Let's get in the right place and see if it goes. They may be running out of time. Who knows? But that's the reason. I think it'll be a shame if we lose Arizona. I think we're probably going to. I think that would be a real shame. Well, Brian, for Vic and me, thank you so much for coming on and doing this. We've kept you over time. And you probably you don't want to miss your lunch that you're going to with the with the ladies. So, um, but we, we'd love to have you back again sometime uh, if, if you'll ever do it. And, and this is really fun. I really, it, it's just like old times. Well, thanks, Neil. Thanks, Vic. Appreciate it. Thank you. Time now for a quick shout out to our sponsor. NHL Wraparound is brought to you by MyGray, your source for game worn jerseys. Head to MyGray.com to get your collection started today. Get real, get it from MyGray. NHL Wraparound subscribers can take 10% off any hockey jersey when they order at MyGray.com and use the coupon code WRAP10. Don't forget that coupon code WRAP10. Earlier in the show, we talked about Neil's Eastern UFAs potentially being on the move. Now we're going to move to the West and the club that everybody's really looking towards in terms of making moves is the Calgary Flames defenseman Noah Hannafin and Chris Tanev. And they, they've been a while, uh, the teams have been looking at this and you, you know, you talked earlier and rightfully so about the Calgary Flames and their sudden late season or it isn't really late season, but mid season surge, uh, that is probably put Craig Conroy in a perplexing situation of thinking, can we make it? Um, certainly if the Calgary Flames, uh, decide that they're not going to make it, the Tanif and Hannafin will probably be traded. They're both very serviceable defensemen, uh, that can play a, a good parts on a playoff team somewhere. Um, I would be surprised if those two defensemen are still with the Flames when the season ends. You got a cup winner from the Tampa Bay years in Tyler Johnson, who is languishing in Chicago right now. You see him moving? The reason I do is I see 119 playoff games and uh, a lot of playoff experience. And if somebody wants a depth forward at this point in his career, I think Tyler Johnson would be a good guy to have. He knows what it takes to win. Uh, He's been through the wars of the playoffs and uh, might be a good pickup for somebody to add to their lineup. Seattle is one of these teams that's kind of teetering out in the West. They're on the outside looking in right now. Jordan Everly and pierre Edward Belmar are a couple of assets that might really help in the right situation. Belmar has a lot of playoff time under his belt. He's got 88 games, I believe it is. He, he played for those Tampa Bay powerhouse teams. He's a great shutdown guy. Uh, he's a big man. Uh, I think he'd be, uh, he reminds me of Craig McTavish uh, pickup in 94, a guy that could come in and play a supplemental role for you. Jordan Eberle is going to take a lot more oxygen out of the room when he comes in because he plays a much bigger part wherever he is, but he's a total free agent at the end of the year and certainly a very gifted player um but will bring in you know will cost somebody a lot more uh to get jordan everly a host of free agents out in arizona uh but right at the top of that list in all likelihood jason zucker and matt dumba dumba is a guy that i think will be on the move um a real good defenseman played really well as a Minnesota wild, uh, all those years. Um, so I would be surprised if Dumba doesn't fit into somebody's plan as a, another defenseman. You need eight good defensemen when you go into the playoffs, cause it's a war of attrition. As far as Jason Zucker is concerned, doesn't have a great playoff resume, uh, really fast. Uh, perhaps if you could get him for the right deal, he could be a supplemental piece to a, a team going into the playoffs. We're going to go to California for our last two clubs and team that a lot of people are looking at are the Anaheim Ducks, uh, Anna Marie and uh, Jakob Silverberg. Yeah, the the problem that I see with Adam Henrique, and a lot of people have mentioned him as a guy that's going to go somewhere in, in the playoffs. 
he's, he hasn't played in a playoff game in 12 years. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I'm not sure how much he'll add in a, in a real playoff run. I mean, he's a good player and he's been around a long time. Um, uh, I, I, and Jacob Silverberg is 35, 36, 37 in that range. He's an older player, hasn't had a lot of playoff experience. Not sure that he'll get moved. I, I My prediction would be that Silverberg doesn't go anywhere and that perhaps Henrique gets traded somewhere, but I don't know how much he'll bring back for Pat Verbeek. In San Jose, sharpshooter Mike Hoffman and a player that made a big impact when he was healthy for Florida last year, and that's Anthony Duclair. You hear rumors about Anthony Duclair going back to Florida, and that wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, the thing that you you got to know is that when you're San Jose, you're not going to make the playoffs. You're not waving a white flag to your fans. They already know you're not going to make the playoffs. Why not get something, whatever you can get? If it, if, it, if it comes down to the fact that all you can get for Duclair is a fifth round pick, well, you're better without, with the fifth round pick than you are with an expiring contract. Um, I think that with Mike Hoffman, I, I, I don't know that he'll get moved. Lot, not a lot of playoff experience there. Good player, but, um, might be a depth guy, but I would think that Duclair definitely would get moved, uh, at the deadline. We talked 18 players in total between the Eastern and Western conferences. You got your tally sheet? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got it. I got I got it waiting there. Uh, and uh, I can't wait for you to put me under the microscope again and bring up these names. Check back in two weeks and we'll find out how Neil did. This is the human side of the story brought to you by UBS Financial Services. And Neil, you got a lot closer to playing in the NHL than most of us that were played small college hockey or in beer leagues or, or whatnot. But I got a story about a guy that actually kind of lived that dream in somewhat of an odd way. So I'm going to take you back to October of 1985 and Bruins and Canucks. And they played this past Saturday and we all know that they played in the 2011 final, but this is probably one of their more memorable moments in the history of those two franchises playing against each other. And I'm just going to say in advance that for our listeners, when the, when the video drops on this, I invite you to go and watch this on YouTube. So the scene set is this, is a high school student named John Purdy somehow managed to get a stick, skates, and a puck into Pacific Coliseum. And during a commercial break, he scaled the glass, put the puck down, and came in on Pete Peters, the Bruins goalie, banked home his own rebound and celebrated to the applause of the audience at the Pacific Coliseum. Then he gets escorted into the penalty box by referee Denny Morrell and then uh, kind of says hello to the Canucks player that was in the penalty box at the time. His name, Taylor Hall. Not that Taylor Hall, but a Taylor Hall that played 41 NHL games uh, for the Canucks and Bruins in the mid to late 80s. And just a couple of uh, funny sidebars to that, that supposedly the stick was smuggled in by one of his friends who tucked it in his pant leg and limped in to make it look like he had some sort of disability or limp. And afterwards, the following day, He was interviewed by a local TV station in Vancouver while sitting in the principal's office. (laughs) Oh, boy, those were the days, weren't they? They sure were. Oh, oh. well, my human side of the story, I want to talk about my friend who we had on this show, Brian Burke, and tell you a little bit more to who the man is. And, uh, you know, you hear about the gruff exterior, you hear about all the different uh, interviews that he does, TV shows that he does, things where he's very, very gruff around the edges. But this is a guy who has very, very strong Irish roots. He's a uh, born in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, uh, moved to and was uh, uh, brought up in Adena, Minnesota. Uh, he was uh, one of 10 children. Uh, he ended up going back and playing at Providence College in, in uh, back in Rhode Island, uh, 
played for the well-known, renowned coach Lou Lamorello at Providence College, went on from there to uh, uh, sign with the Philadelphia Flyers and played one season for the Maine Mariners, their American Hockey League team, where he won the Calder Cup championship with the Maine Mariners. He, uh, After that was over, he ended up going to Harvard Law School and getting his law degree and then became a player agent. Uh, he, as I had said in the show, he represented a guy named Ray Stazak. That's uh, who Detroit signed, and that's why I got to know Berkey. Uh, he went on from there to get a job with Pat Quinn as Pat Quinn's assistant with the Vancouver Canucks, and his career went on from there to, to go to various places. He's done almost anything you can do in the National Hockey League. He's been the uh, Dean of Discipline for Gary Bettman. He was the GM of the Hartford Whalers during some really tough ownership year. Uh, He was general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs, general manager of the Vancouver Canucks, and also, of course, of the Anaheim Ducks. When he did the what seems to be today the unthinkable, he won the Stanley Cup with a small market team of Anaheim. What people might not know about Brian is he's had uh, the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. He he had a a wonderful son named Brendan who was tragically killed in a car accident in 2010 in Indiana. Uh, Brian has really had a hard time with that, as anyone would that loses a child. Um, but he has been a big advocate for uh, his son, Brendan, was gay, and he's had been a big advocate for gay rights, for uh, inclusion. Uh, him and his son, Patrick, have done a lot of work to try to help uh, the, the inclusion aspect of hockey. And now he's with the Women's Hockey League, and, and as the uh, uh, running the PA for the Women's Hockey League, um, Underneath that gruff, big, grizzly bear exterior is a, is a heart of gold that you'll never find anywhere else. And a wonderful guy who would do anything for anyone. And uh, Vic, that is the real story of Brian Burke. And it was a thrill, really, for both of us to be able to have him on, to be as open as he always is, and even throw in some touches of humor. So really thrilled that we have, we're able to have him on today. So that will be a wrap for our show for episode six. Thanks to Migray, UBS, Door, and Ninsel Financial Partners. Thanks to our listeners. And don't forget to subscribe. We're on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please send questions or comments to NHLWrapRound at gmail.com. The mailbox is open. And join us next Tuesday for more NHL discussion. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining us on the NHL Wraparound Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date on all the NHL action. 